So yeah, today we're gonna have Logan Engstrom, Engstrom uh, speaking. He's a student in Maji's lab. He's gonna be talking about uh, reliable machine learning and reinforcement learning. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about the algorithmic aspects of deep reinforcement learning. Um, this is joint work done with uh, Andrew right there and Demetrius and Shivani and uh, also some of our collaborators at Two Sigma and of course our wonderful advisor, Alexander Mondry. Um, so let's just get started. So we've all heard quite a lot about reinforcement learning. Um, probably the most well-publicized example of reinforcement learning recently has been AlphaGo, in which Google made some kind of reinforcement learning algorithm to solve the game or to play the game of Go. Um, there's also applications in robotics, as well as even self-driving cars. Um, but the, all these applications begs the question of whether reinforcement learning is really ready for the, for the prime time. And the answer is no. Um, Deep reinforcement learning is pretty unreliable, even in very simple settings. And you can see this in these two examples. Um, one example, so there's this little half cheetah, and it's supposed to be kind of running along like a real cheetah, except in two dimensions. And, uh, but it's not really doing that. It's going on its back, because it fell into a local minima, and it can't get out. Um, another example is this little reacher robot. And so it has this arm, and it's supposed to be reaching to touch the dot. But what happened was that initialization, this uh, reacher robot had really high weights or something. And so it just kind of got into the spin. And uh, it takes too many steps. It's kind of a classic exploration, um, exploitation trade-off. And uh, it, it's not able to get out of the spin because it's in another local minimum. And so um, how do we really get to this? reliable reinforcement learning. And of course, there's a bunch of problems that need to be solved, um, like value alignment, among other things. But the avenue that we're going to look at today is uh, obtaining an algorithmic understanding of reinforcement learning. Um, because you can't really make something reliable until you understand how it works. So just we're going to first give a brief overview of what re the reinforcement learning uh, framework looks like. So you start off with some kind of environment, and I'm going to use the example of like a stock trading environment. So you have a bunch of you have the market, uh, that's your environment, and you have the initial state, which is a bunch of stock prices and a bunch of tickers. And uh, you're want, and our agent is going to be a robot, and the robot's going to be trying to trade on the stock market and make a lot of money. Um, it has some initial policy, maybe some kind of expert policy or just random initialization. Um, and at the very beginning, the agent sees the state of the market. And the state of the market is, like as I just said, all the, all the stocks and the prices. Uh, and then the agent takes that using its, and then it uses its policy uh, to make a distribution over all the actions that it could possibly take. And so that could be like sell a stock, buy a stock, whatever. And then it chooses from that action distribution uniformly. Um, and then it feeds that back in the environment by playing it. Then after that, uh, the environment shifts to the next state. So like if you sold a stock, maybe the stock market, that the stock price for that stock will go lower. Yes. And, uh, and then uh, that's why we're not at two sigma anymore. Um, and so, so anyway, the state will change. And then you'll get some kind of reward. Like maybe you made money, maybe you didn't make money. And then based off of that information, you're going to shift your policy. Uh, to make your agent even better for the next round. And that's going to repeat a bunch of times. You're going to update your policy. You're going to do the same thing again. You're going to play an action. And then you're going to get another reward in state. And the ultimate goal here is to be able to maximize your overall expected reward over, over the trajectory that your agent's going to play in. So a trajectory is just you start some initial state. You take that state. You play an action. You see the next state. You get a reward. Then you play. You, get, you see that state, and then you play another action, and then you get a reward back, and so on. And you just do uh, state action reward, state action reward, over and over and over until the end of your trajectory, and that's one trajectory. And you want to maximize the total reward that you see throughout that trajectory. And so the class of algorithms that we're going to look at today is all about policy gradient algorithms, um, whose key principle is that we're going to view this expectation maximization goal um, as an optimization problem. And so this term inside, oh, I got a little pointer. It's pretty cool. Uh, so this term inside of the expectation is just the total reward that you get throughout the trajectory. Um, and your goal is to maximize the expectation of uh, the reward that you get while playing uh, the single round of the trajectory. And you want to find the optimal parameters uh, for maximizing this reward. Uh, the method of choice that we're going to use uh, throughout this presentation is just first order methods uh, to, to maximize this reward. Um, but the problem is that we don't have any gradient access. 
and it's a little, it's, it's unclear exactly how we're going to get the gradient from this expectation. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to try to find an estimate of the gradient. It turns out, I'm not going to go into the details here, but it's pretty common in the literature. Um, you can basically model this expectation as the expected value of a variable that's easily computable um, given a trajectory. And so what you can do here is you can just take a finite sample approximation uh, and you can take a bunch of these, these gradient estimates, average them together, and hopefully get something that looks like the actual gradient, which we're going to analyze later. later. Um, then once we get this gradient estimate, we're going to use it in gradient descent. And people have been really successful at using these in practice. Um, there's OpenAI who has done both OpenAI 5, which can beat professional humans at Dota using policy gradient algorithms. And there's also uh, this little, they, they have some kind of robot where you can put a cube in it and then you can say, oh, I have a cube in one orientation, but I want to move it to another orientation. And then it'll kind of, it'll kind of handle it a little bit to be, able to, get to, to, to be able to shift the cube's orientation. And this works pretty well in practice. Um, but it turns out that just like a rotten apple, um, it might look on the, great on the outside, but there's all these like underlying problems. So when you bite into an apple that's rotten, you know, like it looks good, but then you bite into it, it's a little, little moist and juicy, maybe a little brown. You don't want to eat that. Um, and just like that, you probably also don't want to do deep reinforcement learning because it's really annoying. Um, and I'll tell you why. So one, one reason why it's pretty annoying is because there is a super poor reliability over a repeated run. So this is the same game. Um, with the same algorithm, and this is the this this corresponds to time steps. Um, this corresponds to the return that you get at each step of the time step. Um, and the only difference between these two clusters is that so so this line represents five random seeds. Uh, you start at a random seed, then you play the you play the algorithm. Um, so. This represents five, this rep represents another five. They look like totally different algorithms, even though it's the exact same algorithm. The only difference between these two clusters is the choice of five random seeds. Um, so we clearly have pretty bad reliability over repeated runs. Oh, oop, oop. okay. No, we are good, we're good, okay. Uh, another problem is super high sensitivity to hyperparameters. So this is kind of a similar, so this is, uh, the x-axis is gonna be learning rate, it's logarithmic, and the y-axis is, uh, the total word that you get. Each one of these lines represents a, a different algorithm that you use to train the agent, um, but we're just going to look at this green one, which ultimately achieves the highest reward possible. Um, so you can see that at learning rate 11 times 10 to the negative 4, you get reward 0. Um, at learning rate 8 times 10 to the negative 4, you get reward 3,000. That's crazy, isn't it? Uh, super, super high variance just based on this tiny little change in learning rate. Um, and the final issue that we have, well, well, there's a lot of issues, but the final issues that we have room to discuss in this slide is uh, the poor robustness to environmental artifacts. So one example is that um, you have the same game again, and we're just going to scale the rewards at the very end by a constant factor. Uh, and each one of these represents a different constant factor. They should all have the same uh, ultimate, ultimate reward, but because of the reward scaling, they do significantly worse. Uh, so it's pretty weird, and so that's another issue with uh, deep reinforcement learning. Um, notably, so the benchmarks that everyone looks at is basically uh, we're going to take the algorithm and we're going to get the highest expected reward at the very end. And that's the benchmarks that people care about. Uh, that's the benchmarks that people care about in reinforcement learning. And that's not, none, of these, none of these problems are revealed by these benchmarks. And so the question is, where do these issues come from? Um, but it's unclear, because deep reinforcement learning algorithms are super complicated. They have tons of moving parts. and uh, and, and it's just very unclear how to implement them often from just the papers. So one example here is the OpenAI Baselines Repository. It has high-quality implementations of reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, and so in particular, we're going to look at uh, the PPO1 and PPO2 algorithms, which are from the paper that they have about PPO, which is just an algorithm in DeepRL. And so these are all GitHub issues of people complaining about the differences uh, from the paper and between these, two, between these two implementations. And so between the two implementations, there's huge architectural differences. Um, there's huge differences between the policies. They have all these different optimizations on top of the algorithm that they use that they don't mention in the paper at all. Um, there's like super non-trivial changes in the, in the repository compared to the paper um, and so on. And so what, what the overall message of this slide is that uh, the RL algorithms are really complicated and they're really underspecified when you just look at the papers. And so 
basically in in PPO at least uh, they they have the actual item they have in the paper and then they have the implementations and the implementations have all these different kinds of optimizations on top. Um, one example is orthogonal and oh 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 no. Uh, there we go. Um, one example is orthogonal neural network initialization. So it's just a, way, a different way of uh, initializing the weights. So normally in PyTorch, you use like Xavier initialization, which works really well for, um, for image classification tasks. And, uh, but, but they suggest using orthogonal neural network initialization. And so it turns out that when you run the algorithm, uh, using orthogonal initialization, you do way better um, than Xavier. And it's a little unclear why. Even you wouldn't think a priori that this would be a big deal. Yeah, what task is this? Uh, what task is this? Yeah. This is, humanoid. yeah, humanoid, using PPO. Is it, is it stable across different tasks? Uh, yeah, you see the same kind of effects over different tasks. Um, but it's definitely more accentuated with harder tasks. So, where was I? Uh, yeah, so the, this experiment is essentially that um, we took all the different optimizations and we did the Cartesian product all, of all of them. And then we plotted the maximum reward for uh, the half of the Cartesian product with this optimization and without the optimization. And so it turns out that when you use the optimization, you do way better in terms of the maximum reward. And this is true over a bunch of the different optimizations. I'm not going to go into what all these optimizations actually are. Um, but when you look at the maximum reward for all these different optimizations with and without, they're drastically different. And these these by the way, these are not even listed in the paper because that's, that's how unimportant the authors originally thought that they were, um, that they're very common. Um, but people clearly have a very hard time re-implementing these algorithms because uh, it's often unclear what's exactly part of the deep, learning, like the deep uh, RL algorithm that they present and what's just kind of another optimization on top. Um, and so even with these seemingly small changes, performance can super widely vary. Um, and so the overall takeaway take here is that these deep RL methods are um, kind of underspecified and they're really complicated. Um, and the reasons for unreliability and performance are somewhat unclear. Like it's not sure if it's the algorithms or if it's all the little optimizations that they put on top of them. Um, and so this calls for us to go back to kind of a first principles look at what these algorithms are really doing. And to do that, we're going to look at a bunch of different tenets of the policy gradient framework. Um, one of which is uh, gradient estimates, and I'm going to explain all of these as we go, so I'm just going to go quickly through them. Um, another one is value prediction. Uh, we're also going to look at opti optimization landscapes, and finally we're going to look at trust regions at the very end. So the first thing we're going to look at is gradient estimation. So if you recall in our policy gradient uh, framework, one of the key assumptions that we have is that uh, this, uh, this, the gradient that we actually take is um, pretty correlated, or at least correlated with uh, with, with the finite sample approximation that we get. And we want to look at how valid this is in practice. Um, so the experiment that we're going to do is that we're going to fix a single policy, uh, and then we're going to take a bunch of steps, um, each of which uses this uh, case sample gradient estimate. So we're going to take um, a bunch of samples, and then we're going to make a step based off of the sample. And so you should expect that if you have more samples, your, your, est your gradient estimates are going to get better. And we're going to do this a bunch of times. Um, and what we want to be able to do is measure their concentration and see how well these actually concentrate to the true gradient. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to measure the mean pairwise correlation between all the different gradients, that we, the, between all the different gradient uh, estimates that we collect. And so you can think of this as if you have higher pairwise gradient correlation, you're going to have better concentration. If you have lower uh, mean pairwise correlation, you're going to have worse concentration. And so this is just a, this is a uh, plot where on the x-axis you have um, the number of samples that we use. And on the y-axis we have the average, um, basically just the correlation, uh, sorry, the, uh, the concentration um, in that regime. And so uh, higher means that you're basically concentrating to get the actual gradient, and lower means that uh, you're not as much. And so this black line is what um, the algorithms actually use in practice. So you can see that roughly, uh, I don't want to say half, but like about half the time, um, a little less than half the time, uh, your, your, the steps that you take are actually in opposite directions from one another. Um, and the gradients are much less concentrated than they should be. But uh, that's not necessarily as big of a problem as you might think, because in high dimensions, uh, if you have um, very low cosine similarity, uh, it's still pretty significant because you're in high dimensions. The x-axis is the, like, you're changing the state action space? Uh, so the x-axis is the number of samples that we use. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
And so you would expect, yeah. You can finish your sentence. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, is this... Um, oh, you can just ask, like, if you guys are confused, just, just ask a question. Yeah. Is this consistent across different architectures of the policy? Um, so we only tested uh, one architecture of the policy. But um, I, if I had to guess it, I, th I think it would be. It's consistent across tasks, for instance. It, yeah, it is very consistent across tasks, um, across different iterations, yeah. So in this case, what's the dimension of the parameter? Hmm? What's the dimension of the uh, parameter? Uh, about 5,000. <coughs> so if you consider like random Gaussians, and then you have correlation between the random Gaussians, so it's like you get roughly like one over square root D correlation, um, like cosine similarity, I guess, uh, between two random Gaussians. Uh, so you get like, I don't know, maybe point 0.1, point, point, sorry, point 0.01 or point less than that uh, in terms of correlation if you would expect, if you just drew Gaussians in uh, 5,000 dimensions. Um, so this is, this is like, this is non-trivial, and Alec, Alec pointed this out. And so, um, I, well, Alec, yeah, multiple people pointed out similar veins, so I, never mind, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but this is, uh, so, so it's, not, it's not quite as bad as it looks, but there's clearly a lot of room for improvement here. How does it uh, vary across the uh, iterations of the optimization algorithm? Yeah, so at, so at earlier iterations, this looks, looks much better. So if you're at the very start, um, this, this line, like this graph basically just shifted left, and so you kind of get um, actually pretty reasonable correlation um, in the, at the very first iteration. And then I think this is like 150, iteration 150 or so out of 500 or 300, um, and, but it very quickly drops off. So as you go further in the iteration process, um, this graph kind of shifts to the right and you get much worse estimates in terms of uh, concentrating. Any other questions about this slide? Hmm? What do you mean, harder tasks? Harder tasks, yeah. So there's kind of an informal hierarchy of how hard all these different tasks are. Um, I guess you can make it more formal. You get, like, typically, in terms of sample complexity, how many samples you need to be able to learn this task. Um, so this is for humanoid, or this is for, sorry, for Walker 2D, um, but, and which is like, considered one of the harder tasks on Mujoko. Uh, and then there's like easier ones like Hopper, where it's like well, you can just go around like this. And for some reason, that's easier. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give some sense of how bad this could be? Like, is, are are these doing much better than like the worst case scenario? Or yeah, actually, we're going to get to that in the next section. Okay. Yeah. Let yeah. me look at value estimation. Um, so I guess the, the key takeaway here is that we don't have a great understanding of uh, the training dynamics for how this variance really impacts our optimization process. Um, but it would be great if we could use uh, insights from stochastic optimization um, to be able to look at this. It's not exactly the same regime because the samples are, that we get are not exactly, um, they, they aren't independent. And not only that, but they... Uh, but they also, the, like the actual ob objective, because of the way that the, policy gradient, the deep policy gradient methods are organized, it's, is non-stationary. So it's, it, you can't exactly apply SGD, um, but it would be great to use insights from it. Um, oh. oh, okay, no, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and another key thing here is that we're really missing a link between reliability and sample size. So it turns out that when you really scale up these algorithms and use many more and more samples, um, these algorithms become much more reliable. Uh, and it kind of hints at this in this plot because you can see that the gradient estimation is uh, much better when you use many more samples. And so it would be great to get a better understanding of what that's like. And there's actually an open AI paper about that, um, but it would be great to look into it even more. So the next aspect uh, of policy gradient methods that we're going to look into is value prediction. So as we just saw, um, the gradient estimation that we get is really hindered by, uh, in, terms of like, in terms of concentration, the concentration that we get is really hindered by poor variance. Um, and so it'd be great if we could lower this variance. And it turns out that one way to do that is to estimate the values and then use that um, in our policy gradient method. And so the intuition here, and, and so the value, I'm sorry, so the value of the state is, um, if you have a given state, the value is the expected reward that you get after visiting that state. And so the idea is that you, if you can estimate these states well, then you can better separate out the action quality, from, like the, what action you take um, from the action that you take versus what the state quality is. So for example, if you have a robot um, and it's about to fall over or something, then the, then if you, and then you take an action, you don't want to say the action's bad because you're about to fall over anyway, right? And so the idea here is that if you can understand um, what the state contribution to how good the, to how good the uh, 
the algorithm does versus what the action contribution is, and you can significantly lower the variance. Um, and to reduce the variance, you need really you need good value estimates. And the way that we get value estimates is we use a uh, during training we collect all these different samples of uh, of states and rewards, and you can you can calculate what the values are from that. And so we basically just perform a uh, a, uh, a uh, regression task at every at a, like a supervised regression task at every point in the in training process using using the data that we collect. And so we really want to understand here like what does the value what, what do the value estimates we get do in terms of reducing our variance? And how well could we actually do? And also, how bad is it uh, in terms of the baseline if you don't do anything? And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to do a similar experiment to last time, where we vary the number of samples on the x-axis, um, and we vary the, uh, and, and we vary the, uh, the number of the, the uh, concentration on the y-axis. It's the same exact plot as previously. Um, but now we're going to look at three different kinds of agents. So the first agent is when you don't use any baseline at all. So you don't use any value estimation. So uh, then the, the red line here represents what happens when uh, you use the standard value estimation from the algorithm. And then uh, this blue line represents what would happen if you got a near ideal uh, value function. And the way that we calculate that is we basically just take a ton of samples um, and we very, very well approximate what the value function is. So, so just to be clear, we mm -hmm. start here actually refers to the value function of the current policy, not the optimal value function. Of the policy. Yes, okay. the value function of the current policy. Um, so this is no value function, this is the agent's value function, and that's a true value function. Um, and so it turns out that the agent does significantly worse than, than what, it could, what it could be doing if it had the true value function, but it's still doing significantly better um, because, again, remember that we're in high dimensions, so this is actually pretty good. Um, and it's actually doing quite better than uh, no value function, but it, there's clearly significant room for improvement here. And you can see that the uh, concentration gets much better for the true value function. And so one of the key questions here is, uh, if we were able to get better value functions, um, how would that affect training? Like, how, would we, how much better would we be able to do? How much more reliable would it be able to be? Um, and not only that, but uh, how can we actually get better value functions? Because it's clear that there's a big benefit here. Um, and, but what's unclear is how well that would really translate to our optimization in general. So now, um, the third tenant that we're going to look at is of optimization landscapes. And so a key assumption, again, in our policy gradient framework is that um, when we take these gradient steps, we increase, we increase the overall reward that we're going to get from that policy. And so what we want to see is how valid this assumption is in practice. So we're going to look at a lot of plots of this form in the next few slides. Uh, so we're going to make it very clear what these plots are. And so uh, in this direction, so this is essentially in this direction, this is going to be, we're going to fix a policy. And then in this direction represents moving in the actual step direction that we get. And so uh, this point represents what the actual step would be in the next step. Um, then this direction represents going in a random direction and uh, chosen from a Gaussian. And then what the actual plots here represent are the reward that you get at that new policy. So you fix a policy, then you move this much in the, actual, in the agent step direction, and you move this much in the random direction. So one example here is uh, you, this, 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 red, this red stuff right here represents... Uh, you move 2.5 times in the step direction, um, and you move 1.5 times in a random direction, and then this is the ultimate reward that you get from that policy. Um, so this is step zero. You can see that we're doing pretty well here. Uh, you move in the step direction, you get increasing rewards, so which is great. Um, but then by step 150, you can see that this really degrades quite a lot. Uh, and, but just moving in the step direction actually lowers your reward. Um, and that stays true at step 300, uh, and this shows that, and we, we, sh we looked at a lot of this, a lot of these kinds of plots, um, and essentially shows that the, oftentimes the steps are not predictive later in the optimization process. And this looks even better again, this looks even worse again for harder tasks. Um, so for easier tasks, it looks a little better, um, but, but for these harder tasks, it, it looks much worse. Um, so the natural question to ask here is what's going on? Um, and it turns out that when you look at what the algorithms are actually doing, uh, they're not maximizing the, the actual true rewards. What instead they're maximizing is a, some kind of surrogate reward. Sorry, I have a, a question on the previous one. Hmm? So the x-axis is the step taken by the agent? Or yeah, the... Yes, so, so the x, this x, you're talking about this one, right? Yeah, so this represents, 
So I, I fix the policy, and then I move like x times step in in policy space, and then I evaluate what that agent does, how that agent does in terms of reward. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's moving optimization like parameter space. Yes. Okay. Because uh, agent step taken sounds like, sounds like it's agent taken step, but yeah. right. And the random detection would be like adding noise to the gradient. Yes. But aren't there results that show that adding noise to policy gradients actually helps? Um, I'm not aware of any, but it would be. Okay. I'm happy yeah. to talk cool. offline about that. Sure. You're also it's adding noise to like the policy parameters. Oh yeah, it's also adding noise to policy parameters. I'm not sure. Yeah, if that's there's a paper from OpenAI called Parameter Space Exploration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, oh yeah. Any other questions about these slides? Is everyone clear about what's going on here? You move in the parameter space in the step direction, and you can move in a random direction. This is the kind of plot you get. Yeah? Well, the second plot, because we are kind of following the gradient direction, why is it kind of reward is going down? This part I We're, we're going to explain that in the next slide. And so that's the that's the key question here is like why is it that when we go um, why is it that we go in the direction of uh, the actual step that we take why is it that the true reward is going down and it turns out that these methods actually don't optimize the true reward what they instead optimize is something called a surrogate reward I'm not going to go into detail about it but we can talk afterwards um, about what this actually is and. Uh, what we want to check here is how the landscape of surrogate rewards compare to the landscapes of true rewards. And so this is a surrogate reward landscape. It's the exact same format as our previous landscape, except that now it's a surrogate rewards instead of the true rewards. Um, so surrogate is coming in because of like the proximity stuff in the in PPO? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they look at um, like the, the basically the policy ratio times the, times the, uh, times the advantage. And that's what they're optimizing instead of the true rewards. And so uh, this is what the agent is actually optimizing. So you can see that it has a maximum right where the uh, step direction is. So it's actually maximizing the surrogate reward really well. And that makes sense because it has full access to the surrogate reward. So it should be able to optimize it really well. Um, oh, and it uh, should be clear that the surrogate reward is based off of what it sees in training. Um, it's just that they have some kind of smooth approximation and uh, it's, it's based on some theory. And so, the, uh, but what actually hap what ends up happening here is that uh, this, these actually these actually work pretty well. This is step zero, and what happens is you move up in the in the surrogate in the surrogate landscape direction. You also move up in the corresponding uh, reward direction. So this, this step does pretty well. But then by step 150, you run into the same problem that we saw in the last slide, where uh, where you move in the surrogate direction, it looks like this is the optimum. Um, but then what actually ends up happening is that in the true reward landscape, you're going, you're going down. You're getting worse rewards. And this uh, continues to be true at step 300 uh, and 450. You, this looks great, right? You just optimize as much as we want. Um, but it turns out that uh, even when you move in the step, even when you move in the surrogate direction, increasing the surrogate rewards, uh, you're seriously not doing very well in the true rewards landscape. The landscape is the landscape for the value network, or how do you get the surrogate landscape? Yeah, so I'm happy to talk offline about it. Um, but essentially, the surrogate landscape is it's just a function of the trajectories that you see. Um, so you collect all these different trajectories and training, and then you make a surrogate out of it, um, which is motivated by some theory work. Um, and it, it does, yeah, it uses the value function as well. Yeah, it's it's a landscape um, the, the policy. Wait, what? I'm sorry, what? It's the landscape for the policy network. Like this is all the policy parameters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is this is we're again operating in policy space. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. No. <laughs> so you can think about this like just abstractly. You can think about the surrogate reward as something that the algorithm is actually optimizing over. Like it takes in the trajectories and then it makes a um, a landscape what it thinks that the uh, in terms of it makes a landscape that um, it thinks corresponds to the true landscape, um, and then it optimizes that instead of optimizing over this true landscape. And from my side, I think there's two approximations. One is you use uh, Monte Carlo to sample. Uh, to estimate the uh, expectation, that is one kind of approximation. The other approximation is that 
I even do not know the true value function, so I need to use some network to approximate that one. So by surrogate here, so which approximation you are really It, it uses both of them. Both of them. Yeah. And so it, it uses a value function, and it uses um, the samples that we get, but it's just not, it's not looking at the actual rewards you get. It's looking at some function of the actual rewards you get. Are you measuring these functions on the same scale? So are, are we seeing? Yeah, so you should. Prove the surrogate reward by a very small amount. It's right. So you should ignore the scale in terms of like the only thing that's important about this is the direction. Like it, um, like this, this goes up. This should also go up. I'm just curious in trying to take a step to achieve a very small improvement in the surrogate reward. Are we seeing a comparatively much larger decrement in the true reward, or are these scales not comparable? Um, yeah, these scales are not comparable. Okay. Um, but it's definitely, regardless, like it, it is concerning that you move, when you're increasing the surrogate reward, you are decreasing the true reward. Yeah. But does the network, does the agent actually uh, become better? Yes, it, yes, it does. Yeah, so that's a key thing. Throughout this whole presentation, I am not saying that these deep RL algorithms do not work, because they do work. But how can it become better if I always pretty much, after some point, decrease my true reward? That's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I mean, we have some hypotheses, but uh, it's, it's a little unclear. Yeah. And this could be a source of the unreliability issues that we see. So for this uh, slide, uh, you kind of, do you think that's the error, kind of the error, many from the Monte Carlo or many from the value function approximation? Um, I think it, both of them are probably, but I think both, both probably play a part in this. <laughs> but it's more about the, I think both of these play a part in it. Um, but but we, actually, so when we take this state, step, we use a lot of, we use many, many samples. So these actually should be pretty good. Um, like when we take the step, we're not taking like the actual agent step. What we're actually doing is we're using many, many samples to get like a, a pretty good approximation of what the agent step should be. So I, I don't think that those, this, those issues are super big. It's like a third source of approximation. Yeah, yeah. Approximation yeah it, it's, it's kind of a, another sort, like a third source of approximation error is like the actual function that they build out of the, out of the trajectories and out of the value function and such on, in the, in the estimates. So in the same way that you don't optimize accuracy when you train deep networks, you optimize cross entropy. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. You don't optimize reward, you optimize some surrogate of the reward. Yeah. That's what we're seeing here. Yeah, that's a great that's a great explanation. So, <clears throat> so I guess the the quantity on the x-axis, the way I should think about it is like the step size in my uh, optimization algorithm, right? Yes. But then, presumably, the scale at which you're plotting things is much larger than the regime in which the step sizes are operating and training, at least. So one one here right. is the actual step. Yeah. So. So if you if you oh, go, oh, oh, I if you go to this scaled with the yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you just do early stopping at one fifty, would you get <laughs> 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 No, actually I mean you you definitely improve over time. So it's not like these algorithms are not working, it's just it's just a little unclear um, what the mechanisms behind them are that are making them work. Improving in total reward or like the return cross episodes? I'm sorry, what? Like uh, it's a y axis in the right plot here, this is the same thing you're claiming the the, uh, that the, the total reward will increase over time. Like if you look at the graph. Yes, 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 yes. This, this, this quantity exactly corresponds to what should be increasing over time. So then how can that be if every step you take decreases? So it's not every step. It's it's not every step. step. Like, like, so we sample a couple of steps. It could be that you take like very few really high magnitude jumps, but then if you sample at any point, you're likely to see like some small decrease. And so maybe on average, like this doesn't do so well, but you might get a few steps that are doing really well. And so it kind of bounces out. So is this reward the return, or is it the stepwise reward? Uh, um, the, re the total reward over it. Yeah, this is a total reward. Yeah. Okay, it's a discounted return. A this is a, yeah, it's discounted return, actually, yeah. Um, so as we can see here, uh, the surrogate reward is often very misaligned with the true reward landscape. Um, and, and it's important to note that all the, all the, everything we've looked at so far has been in this high sample regime. So every time that we look, we try to make an approximation of how good each one of these agents are, um, we get the discounted reward using uh, 1,000 trajectories, which is pretty good. Like, you can get a pretty good estimate of this. Um, but 
when the agent's actually learning, it only uses about 20 trajectories. So what does the agent actually see when we're going through this out, throughout this optimization process? <coughs> so th these are uh, 20 sample estimates, which means that uh, each one of these points corresponds to taking 20 trajectories um, per word estimate. And so you, you take the step, um, you look at this new agent, then you run through 20 trajectories, and then you see what the uh, mean discounted word was. Um, the mean, uh, discount, uh, mean, mean return. Then this is what happens when you take uh, 200 samples at every point. This is what happens when you take 1,000 samples at every point. And so you can see here that if you use many, many samples, you get a really nice, like, smooth landscape. Um, but this improvement is, so if you, if you move in this direction, even though you are definitely actually improving these rewards, um, it's a little hard to detect in the agent sample regime. And this is concerning because uh, this is what the agent actually uses to make steps. And so it's hard for the agent to even know if it's making progress because of how noisy this landscape is. Um, so the two key takeaways here are that first, uh, these landscapes are not very re reflective of the true rewards, and it would be great to understand why and how that impacts the optimization process. Um, and it would also be great to understand how we can better navigate uh, the reward landscape because it seems like the circuit reward maybe is not the best way to do this. Um, the final aspect of these policy grading methods that we're going to look at is trust regions. So in parameter space, you can think of our optimization process as follows. You have this original point um, in optimization space, then uh, you take a step and you go to the next point, you take another step, you go to the next point, and so on. Um, and at every step, what happens is you take a bunch of trajectories and uh, you make sure that the step that you take based on those, based on those samples uh, is within a trust region. And so each one of these steps is, uh, has to be within this trust region because you want to be able, because the, the samples that you take are only informative um, locally around where the current agent is because that's where, that's where you took the samples. So you want to make sure that the steps that you actually take um, are actually informative, uh, are actually informed by the samples that you took. And so the idea is that you want to be able to take steps in this trust region, um, but if you go outside the trust region, then it's a little unclear about what you're actually going to get because you didn't take samples there. You took samples here. Um, and so what PPO and TRPO use, uh, they use a, uh, they're motivated by this KO-based trust region where you're looking at the maximum, uh, maximum KL distance between the, the action distributions induced by states. And so intuitively, you can think of this as uh, keep, make sure that even in across all the states that you could possibly see, uh, make sure that the way that I choose my action is not too different from my current policy to the ne my next policy. So when I take a step, I want to make sure that uh, the, in my next policy, it's not going to be too different than the way that I take uh, my steps, the way that I take my actions, and even in across all the states. But this is hard to enforce in practice because we don't see the whole state space. Um, and so instead what we do is we relax to an expectation. And what we see here instead is we want to intuitively constrain like, the mean way that we take actions at every, at every state. Does this make sense? Um, and so what we want to see here is what actually happens in practice. Like, are, does, our next, um, does our next agent actually satisfy this constraint? And so uh, right here is this represents like the iteration in our optimization process. So there's like 450 steps and we're going to look at uh, at every step. We're going to see what the mean KL distance was between our, our, our current agent and the next agent. And so it should be around here, um, which is what TRPO gets. And TRPO actually does this very nicely and it, it uh, really maintains the trust region. But when, did, is, is everything clear so far? That's great, okay. So, but the PPO algorithm does not. So you can see here that we go from two to the negative six KL, mean KL, to uh, two to the negative three KL across the point of training, and it doesn't look like there's any sign of stopping. Um, but interestingly, uh, the, so the optimizations help quite a lot. So we have this core um, PPO algorithm, uh, and it purports to keep this mean KL the same, or, or, or it has a relaxation, but it purports to, this is like the overall goal of this algorithm is to keep uh, this, this mean KL the same while, while, while relaxing the constraints computationally so they're easier to compute. So um, is it just the loss and Taylor approximation, the, the going from 2 to the minus 5 to 2 to the minus 3? I'm sorry, what? Like, P PPO is 
using a more approximate yes. form, right? So, Certainly. I mean, there is going to be a loss also just from like Taylor mm -hmm. Taylor's approximation that's yes. invoking. And do you have a sense of whether it's all attributable? Yeah, so that's that's really interesting. Yeah, so that's what that's what we're looking at right here is the fact that this algorithm and this algorithm use the exact same enforcement method. Um, like these two methods, in terms of if you just read the paper, you would think that um, these would enforce this mean KL just as well because they use the exact same enforcement method. But <laughs> when you put all these different optimizations on top of um, PPO, it turns out that you can get significantly better uh, trust region enforcement. And these optimizations include like learning rate annealing, um, like value clipping, um, and so on, and using like orthogonal weights and so on. Um, and so it's unclear exactly uh, what is causing what is causing this trust region to be enforced, but this trust region not to be enforced because they are the same algorithm. Like so, this is PPO. Green is PPO. And uh, this blue one is PPOM, which is like PPO minimal, which is what you would get if you just uh, implemented the PPOR algorithm as stated in the original paper. And then this is what you get when you use all the different optimizations that you find in the OpenAI GitHub repository. And so what's interesting here is that um, even though the enforcement method mechanisms, if you just looked at the algorithm, um, appear to be the same, the optimizations cause, it, cause the uh, actual enforcement in practice to be drastically different along these two algorithms. I mean, this part is not as surprising just because presumably a lot of the optimizations were done to actually stabilize the, the numerical aspects. And at least if your uh, policies become more, uh, are changing in a more stable fashion, then by definition, trust regions are going to be uh, better maintained as well. I mean, so, so, so what they optimize for here is not they aren't trying to make anything more stable. What they're trying to do is maximize total rewards at the end, right? Right, but they're, they're presumably trying to make, do it in a somewhat more uh, reliable manner across the different tasks that they're evaluating on. So it might very well be an uh, artifact of. Right, it could be an artifact of that optimization. Um, I guess what's interesting to, um, here in general is that I don't know about, I mean, maybe this is just me, but when I look at the optimizations that I, I don't see like maintaining trust regions at all in any of them. Um, like the only mechanism that I actually see in the algorithm for maintaining trust regions is like the key PPO like ratio clipping thing, which is kept constant across both of these. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that like, like, or at least it's somewhat surprising I think to us that like the mechanism that's designed to maintain a trust region does not seem to be the thing that's actually maintaining the trust region. It seems to be like some other stuff that we added on top. Um, so I guess as we just talked about, uh, one of the key uh, questions to ask here is what part of these algorithms are actually doing what? Um, and how do we reason about these algorithms when they're using such loose relaxations to uh, the original trust, region, trust regions that they were supposed to be um, theoretic, at least in terms of theoretically groundedly um, using? Uh, and not only that, but how can we capture the different kinds of uncertainty that we have in our algorithms in our trust regions? So the original trust regions that motivate the trust regions that these deep RL algorithms use don't take into account stuff like uh, like bad value functions or um, really uh, unconcentrated gradients and so on. Um, and so it would be great to see what kinds of uh, trust regions we can come up with that take these into account. I guess the difficulty I'm having with this part is so PPO is fundamentally like once you once once you do a Taylor approximation of KL, sure you could still go back and measure KL, which is kind of what you're doing, but you could also say that it is just defining a different notion of what a trust region should be. And uh, you know, what do things look like if you actually just evaluate uh, what PPO is enforcing? Yeah, we actually looked at that too. Um, I didn't choose to include that in the slides because I didn't want to, I, I thought it would be too much, I guess, but um, I'm happy to talk about that. We have that in our paper. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. What's the main takeaway from this part? Because all of these, mm -hmm. I mean, even the PPO paper, they say that, yeah, we use like a very loose relaxation, but mm -hmm. empirically we observe success, which is essentially what this section of the presentation is also saying. But it doesn't seem to be due to the relaxation. Or like you could just not have the relax. Like it turns out that if you just remove the relaxation that PPO does, but you mm -hmm. do all the optimizations and you do them slightly better, mm -hmm. you can just enforce the same trust region. So like the whole clipping thing, like you can just set the hyperparameters exactly right so that it never leaves the clipping thing and then it's all fine. So the clipping doesn't actually seem to be doing it. Mm -hmm. It's more like like 
the optimizations that we added on top of the clipping thing make it make the optimization so nice that you don't actually need the trust region in the first place. Thank you. Um, so just general takes away, takeaways that we can get from this. Um, in general, these deep RL methods are really complicated and they have a lot of moving parts and they're hard to understand. Um, not only that, but these deep RL training dynamics are really poorly understood. Um, the steps that we take are often really uncorrelated. Uh, the surrogate rewards don't match the true rewards and the trust regions don't hold oftentimes, for, at least for the reasons that we think. Um, and so the question, big question here is how do we proceed? Like what, what are we going to do in the future about this? Um, and so the first thing that uh, we might want to do is try to reconcile RL with our conceptual framework, try to make our deep RL algorithms um, actually match the uh, policy gradient framework better. And so how can we do that? Um, another step that we could do is try to rethink uh, our framework for these deep RL methods, try to move our framework closer. And so for that, we would have to figure out how to deal with high dimensionality and these algorithm, different kinds of optimizations that they put on top of the, um, on the core method. Uh, and not only that, but dealing with these non-convex function approximators of deep learning, deep networks. Uh, <clears throat> and finally, I, our, our results suggest that we need better evaluation for RL systems. Um, we can't just, we have to move past like a return based um, centric benchmark system and try to look holistically at all the different aspects of these algorithms, like trying to look at reliability and ro robustness and safety. <coughs> um, and if you want to read more, we have a paper and we also have a bunch of blog posts. Mm -hmm. I'm quite curious to see, um, did you run similar probes on some either bandit-like settings or like just supervised settings to see how how much uh, like the gradient estimation issue or the trust yeah. region issue? Comes yeah, so we actually looked at um, using SGD to maximize, a, or one of our, so some, one of our, one of our buddies looked at, um, uh, at uh, maximizing, basically just looking at toy settings in SGD, um, like using like uh, using SGD to maximize a quadratic or something. Um, and so it turns out that you can make this step super uncorrelated. <clears throat> you're still going to maximize the uh, quadratic pretty well. And so um, and so we thought that was pretty interesting. But the dynamics in in RL are very different. Um, like as a, for the reasons that we mentioned before about lack of independence and uh, and, um, and non-stationarity, uh, so we we've looked at some experiments that are similar in uh, in these regimes. I think bandits would be a great place to look as well. But I mean, I think bandits are bandits are very theoretically well understood, and there's not too many moving parts in them, right? Like there's kind of just there's kind of a core algorithm, um, but it would be I think it would be it would be good to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, I'm just still a little bit confused about the part that, like your gradients seem to be very uncorrelated, and your reward, true reward seems to be going down most of the time. So, is it just pretty much like taking random action? Like, ra like what if you actually try, like, did you try to just instead of following your gradient, just take a random direction and then keep it if if it becomes better or stuff like that? Yeah, so that's actually a technique that people use as like finite differences uh, methods. Um, there's a paper from Ben Recht about it called uh, like random. Uh, search is a competitive yeah, random search is a competitive baseline for deep RL or something. Um, which is a, it was a good paper, pretty pretty interesting paper at least. Uh, so basically, what they do is just they just take a bunch of random directions and see which ones do well, and they they do a bunch of other kind of optimizations on top of this. They do some kind of wacky stuff about like throwing away different directions, but um, but yeah, it's kind of the same core algorithm, and it, it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to start from scratch, approaching this problem domain, are there are there things you think you would leave out of the kind of present framework for RL, or replace with something else, or yeah, what? What kind of ideas do you have about how to avoid having some of these issues at all? Yeah, so I think that it would be great to look at, like as we design these algorithms, it would have been great to look at 
um, how the different optimizations that we use actually impact the performance. Um, like people, at least, I mean, so the policy gradient framework that people came up with is not intended for these deep RL methods um, or for these kinds of tasks as much. So I, I think it would be good to design, I, I think it would be good, I'm, I'm not sure, I guess, about how I would design the framework, but I, I think that in general, when developing these kinds of methods, I would be more careful about looking what the impact is of different um, algorithmic aspects um, and trying to really understand what's causing performance and what's causing reliability or unreliability or lack of performance. Yeah. Have you tried just using a linear model? As in, like, it's a, it's a problem mm -hmm. here caused by your network? Yeah, so actually you can solve this without any deep learning um, using a linear model with these algorithms. Right, I'm, I'm saying, like, have you done experiments? Have we done experiments on this? Like, say, like, the, the optimization landscape. Mm -hmm. if you have a linear function, linear uh, function approximator. Does it also look like that? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I would suspect that it looks that the experiments would be similar. Um, but I think that it would be a that would be interesting to look at. And actually, so Ben Rack's paper uh, uses a linear uh, linear approximator. The, the, the random yeah. search one. Andrew, do you have something? Uh, is the, the surrogate landscapes look like vaguely linear, even for the two layers? Yeah. So if you look at the surrogate landscapes, for the later yeah. So if you look at the surrogate landscapes, they're like kind of they're like vaguely linear. Um, I mean, which kind of makes sense because. I mean, I don't know if it makes sense, but but they're, but they're, but the 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 actual thing you're optimizing is linear in the outputs of the network, um, and so these kind of look pretty linear. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if that's a, I don't think I'm not sure if that's a good connection. Yeah. I mean, if you have a multi-layer linear network, then the optimization is not linear. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, it was uh, two. Oh no, uh, it was a two-layer uh, MLP. Was the learning rate used for most of these? Um, it varied a lot per experiment. I think we used. Was it? Yeah, we best used one. whatever the best one it was during hyperparameter hyperparameter tuning. So like ten to negative four. I uh, saw so like earlier you had this plot. <laughs> yeah, I think it was probably something around yeah ten to negative two and ten to negative four. Do all the environments show plots like this? Yeah. So we, we actually, so in our appendix, we have everything. We have like 30 pages of appendix or something. So you can take a look at that. And so, I mean, for easier tasks, they look, they look much better, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, we mostly looked at it in this Walker 2D, which is the hardest one. Yeah, it's curious. You would imagine that more unstable environments, probably they're more sensitive, but more stable in, like, perhaps things that balance, they're more unstable, whereas maybe things like cheetah and stuff, they're more stable. I thought that was clear to all, but apparently not. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I guess I'm not sure. I'm not sure, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't really have a good intuition for how the, the different games should work. Mm -hmm. Maybe I missed this. So, um, thinking about RL evaluation, do you have a constructive suggestion for how we might go beyond just benchmarks and eventual average reward? <laughs> What what might be an alternative evaluation that exposes like this uh, hypersensitivity to hyperparameters and things like that? Yeah, I mean, so we, we never talked about uh, ideas for that. We haven't talked about ideas for that yet. Um, I I guess we haven't we haven't thought about that too much. I would say that um, one thing would at the very least. So if you look at a lot of these papers, um, when they showcase results, they don't showcase they they kind of show the results in a way that makes it look more stable than it is. And so one example is it's super common practice to use like smoothing um, and, or to, so they basically say like, um, we're gonna look at a weighted average of what my returns are um, over time rather than actually getting what the true rewards are over time and plotting that. Um, I think it would be good just as a very basic start to have more rigorous evaluation there. Um, and actually, one big problem with comparing methods is that when people use all these different kinds of, like they use smoothing or they, uh, they say like, oh, I'm going to collect five seeds and I'm going to choose the one that does the best, um, <laughs> which is crazy, right? And so I, I think as a very basic start, it would be good to just have some honest um, like guidelines for for uh, for just even showing like reward curves, and there's a long way to go there. Is there any more questions? Yeah.
Uh, if there's any more questions, I think uh, they're like around today and tomorrow. So if you want to meet with them, please, uh, by all means. And let's thank the speaker again.